Greetings, everyone. I'm Aaron Simon from 3D Universe, and I'm also here with Mike Larson and Bryce. Uh, help me with the last name, Bryce. Is it Palachuk? Palachuk. Palachuk, thank you. Sorry, I didn't know how to pronounce that. It's funny when you work with people by email primarily, you know, you sometimes don't get the pronunciations. <laughs> so uh, it's good to have you guys with me, and uh, welcome everyone back to another episode of 3D Universe Untethered. And uh, as always, I just want to point out that you can find the information for these sessions on our blog, which is 3duniverse.org. Geographic in the upper left for 3D Universe Untethered. That's where you'll find the, the details, the recordings, etc. And um, uh, keep an eye out there because we always have great content coming up. We do these every two weeks, and they're, they're a lot of fun. So today is going to be um, a, a fun discussion. I, I have with me two of my colleagues from the Enable volunteer community here. Um, as uh, some of our viewers already know, um, I have a long history with the Enable volunteer community. I've worked with them for, I don't know, seven, eight years now. Uh, it's been very much a part of sort of how I actually built 3D Universe. It was in large part as a, a way of, of working with that community specifically, and we've continued to work with them over the years. Um, so I want to have you guys kind of give an introduction, uh, each of you, maybe starting with you, Mike. Just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and uh, uh, how, you know, how you've uh, sort of been involved in, in this, this kind of uh, community. All right. Um, well, I live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I uh, am in real estate. Uh, I've, you know, all my life, I've kind of been like to take things apart and see how they work. And uh, so I was actually looking to uh, learn more about 3D printing. And as I was doing my research, I came across Enable. And uh, how been able to do it. and uh, I've never really given any thought to uh, you know looking for a prosthetic hand or what we want. And uh, when I saw that, I thought that would be pretty neat to check out. So I got started two years ago. Had someone there build me a hand, uh, been playing with it and modifying it, and doing different things uh, all that time, and uh, that led to trying to get. A hold of someone at and be able to help me develop it even further and that's how we ended up uh, connecting and moving forward with the group that we're doing now to, to try to create the next level i guess of the next generation yeah yeah and we'll be we'll be talking a lot about that today i and before i get to you bryce i want to just point out that i think a lot of the people who are watching here already know about enable most likely but in case you don't the enable volunteer community check it out at enablingthefuture.org this is a global community of volunteers that are using 3D printers to produce free uh, 3D printed prosthetic devices for people who need them, uh, mostly people in underserved communities around the world. And we've been doing this successfully for about eight years now, nine years almost, if you think about when it really started. And uh, we, we've, uh, we've achieved a lot, I think. Now, let's see, I'm being told I have some audio distortion. Are you guys hearing that, uh, Mike? How am I coming through? Sound fine to me. Sounds okay. Okay, I think I was getting some background noise from from one of us, so I I, I, uh, I muted you there. I think we're okay for now. Um, anyway, so check it out at enablingthefuture.org. It's a wonderful organization, and everybody is welcome, whether you have a three D printer or not. There are lots of ways to contribute, and it's just a fantastic organization. So I just wanted to point that out in case we have anybody with us that just doesn't know what we're talking about here and what Enable is. Um, Great community. Check it out at enablingthefuture.org. So over to you, uh, Bryce. Let me unmute you and go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about your background. Cool. Uh, I am based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I am a mechanical engineering master's student. And over the past summer, I had some free time on my hands due to COVID, and I found the Enable community. And I also have a 3D printer myself. So. I decided to get involved with the community and I printed my first hand uh, two months ago and I delivered it to a seven year old kid in the United oh. Kingdom. Nice. Come on. I like that. <laughs> it was good. It was the uh, unlimited arm design. So it was very interesting to build that design. Excellent. Yeah. So this, this community has been doing mostly hand type devices for these uh, past eight, nine years, but has since sort of moved into arms, uh, so devices for people that have a functional elbow but can use the elbow to activate a device, so they're missing most of the limb below the elbow. But now we even have devices for above elbow amputees that are shoulder operated that use a harness. There's all kinds of new uh, designs evolving. People are working on lower limb uh, devices as well, which 
obviously have some additional risks with them, but there are groups exploring that work. So there's lots of exciting things happening in the community. Um, and, you know, it's great to have you two with me because, the, you know, we are, of course, part of a team that is currently working collaboratively, as Mike mentioned, to design what we hope will be sort of a new and improved enable hand design, taking what all of us on the team know. This is a team of 11 people that have all come together. Um, some of us have quite extensive backgrounds with Enable, others are newer. Some of us, like Mike, are actually users of the devices and, and have experience using them directly. Uh, some of us are coming with CAD experience, others have different types of experience. And it's this, this great sort of multi-skilled team that's come together and taking all of our different experience and, and you know what we've learned about these different designs and what works great and what didn't work so great and what we'd like to see better and trying to pull all that together into like, you know, the next hand design. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that, kind of what led us to this point, Mike. Talk a little bit about the designs that you've used yourself and sort of what your experience was and where you felt the need to make like changes and, and how that led to where we're at. Well, it's really been kind of an evolution. When I, when I first got the hand, I worked with this lady to put one together, size it and all that. Uh, when I first got it, it was fun to see what you could do with it, you know, pick things up. And, you know, I have a uh, video on my YouTube channel, you know, actually kind of juggling, you know, as I as I got better and better with it. Um, and then uh, kind of along with that, I had a couple things break. I, you know, kind of started thinking about different ways I could, I could do things. And so I, it, it kind of morphed. I you know, changed out a lot of things and I created a new um a couple new things and uh and it, it went from it went from you know the mechanics of it to you know the fit of it uh the functionality of it even the design of it which is kind of what we're working on now um and the comfort of it so it's like i said it's been an evolution and it's been you know a lot of improvements and it's gotten to the point now where it works really well uh, more, you know, when I first got it, it was almost kind of a novelty, and it was something to play with. Um, but as I worked with it, made it better, and gotten more used to it, it's really kind of something I I use pretty regularly. Um, so it's uh, it's it's an evolution. It's great to be now working with this group because I can only do so much. I'm not a 3D printer guy. You know, I, some of the parts I made are handmade out of whatever you know materials. You know, there's fishing gear. There's gun uh, holsters, there's all kinds of things. So I'm looking forward to actually. That's great. We talked a little bit about that. You know, it's it's funny how some of us in the Enable community and some of us who are just into 3D printing, we just have this, this tendency to assume 3D printing is the answer. And it's not always, you know, there are some very creative ways of getting things done. There's lots of different materials you can use. And so it's great to have people that come with a different mindset uh, that aren't necessarily oriented just towards the 3D printing way of, of, of right. doing because it, it gives us different ideas. So it's like, uh, it's like what they say when the only tool you have is a hammer, you know, everything looks like a nail, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. So we're going to talk a little bit about that work. I guess it's worth pointing out for the, for the folks watching, this is a work in progress, right? We don't have this, this design we're talking about ready to show you. This is just something that we have, have started working on in recent weeks, and we will have a design, we hope, in the uh, weeks or months to come. Maybe we'll regroup and share that with you. But for today, we just wanted to talk about the process and uh, what we're going through and, and hopefully get input from people that, that we can incorporate into this. So I thought it might be helpful before we get more into that to just do a little bit of a quick review of some of the designs that we're kind of building off of here. Some of the people watching this might not be as familiar with them. And I certainly don't have all of them here. I mean, as you guys on the call know, I mean, there are a lot of designs that this community has produced. And I, I you know, we'd be here all night if I tried to show you all of them. But some of the more popular ones I wanted to go through because it'll help people to understand sort of how we got to where we are and what we're trying to do next. So I'm going to switch over the view real quick just so that uh, I can go a little bigger on screen. I'll come right back to you guys. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go all the way back to the original 3D printed hand design that started this whole thing. But, you know, somewhere thereafter in, uh, I guess it was around 2014, uh, myself and a group of other enablers got together to collaboratively design, much like we are now, a new design that we wanted for a conference we were putting on for Enable. And so we had a very aggressive timeline and 
we, we worked together and in a matter of about a, a month, as I recall, maybe a month and a half, we, we cranked out this new design called the Raptor Reloaded. Uh, it was actually the Raptor and then a, a, a second version came days later called the Raptor Reloaded, which was similar but built in Autodesk Fusion. And that's what you see here. It had a different kind of a look, very uh, sort of an attractive, that sort of, I guess you'd call it sort of a robotic look that some of the, some folks really like. Uh, it had it a lot more 3D printed components than some of the previous designs, which used metal hardware. So the fingers are connected with 3D printed uh, snap pins that go in there at the hinges. Those are produced on the 3D printer. So the only thing you're using that's not 3D printed is some screws for the assembly, some Velcro, uh, some padding, and the, you know, the cords, the flexible and non-flexible cords that operate the hand. So that was the Raptor Reloaded design, and it served us very well for a number of years. This was the number one design the community was making. But one of our volunteers, Eric Bubar, is a professor and part of the community, did some excellent uh, quantitative testing, stress testing, on how well these different designs hold up when you put them under a, a, amount of, a certain amount of stress. Where do they break? And how good is their grip strength? How effective are they? And he actually found that the Raptor Reloaded did not do nearly as well as some of the other designs that had come out since then. Uh, and so we as a community kind of collectively decided, you know, we probably don't want to recommend the Raptor Reloaded or the Raptor anymore. It's, it's good for kind of experimental or historical purposes, but we've moved beyond this. It's been kind of retired. Um, one of our designers, Peter Binkley, came up with this design, very different looking. This is called the Osprey hand, and this was developed to be a very robust, very strong hand for an adult user that, that really does a lot of physical activity and wants to have something that would really hold up. One of the key differences, other than the, the aesthetic differences, is that it has uh, these monofilament lines that operate both as a push and pull mechanism. So those same lines are, are pulling the fingers in and pushing them back out instead of having the flexible and non-flexible cords like the other design. That's a key difference and it makes for a, a very strong grip actually. So there's some benefits to that. Interesting tensioner mechanism that uses these set screws to clamp down on those lines, which makes them easily adjustable. Uh, it uses leather for the part that goes over the forearm and the part that goes over the palm which I'm told is very comfortable, very durable, and it molds to the user's uh, anatomy over time, as leather tends to do. So really nice design. Some people love this look. Other people really don't care for it, you know, the, the sort of the blockiness. But again, that's entirely up to preference. Um, again, lots of other designs coming up along the way here, but I want to kind of jump to the Phoenix hand. Uh, there are several versions of the Phoenix. The Phoenix V2. Uh, the Unlimited Phoenix from Team Unlimited out in the UK, and then the Enable Phoenix V3. These are all just slightly different versions of the same hand. Uh, some of them have the, the palm mesh here built in, as you can see, where it's 3D printed as part of the hand, and then can be thermoformed a little bit to sort of shape to the palm. Uh, other versions, like the V2, has a separate palm mesh that gets attached with screws. The, uh, the, the tensioner system, the pins are slightly different. One of them has a, a whipple tree mechanism. Some, as you can see here, do not. But otherwise, the designs are very similar. One of the differences with the Phoenix hand is that instead of the flexible cords, this one uses these elastic uh, dental bands, like the kind you use on, on braces. And uh, interesting that I'm showing you this hand because it shows one of the issues that we've discovered over time, which is, I'm taking one of these off, these things break down over time. I don't know if this will show up on camera, but they it, it kind of starts to get, yeah, see it just pulled apart. They really just kind of start to disintegrate over time. And so they, they don't hold up well. We've been including, you know, when we, we make kits for these things with the assembly materials, we give people a whole big packet of them because they're going to have to replace them frequently. But we're looking for a, a better option. Um, this really worked well for quite some time. This has been, I would say, the go-to design, one of the Phoenix hand versions for quite some time now probably the last couple of years, along with their arm, the unlimited arm, which I think Bryce mentioned, and uh, that's, that's been probably the most popular arm design. So this one's been great. More recently, we had uh, one of our volunteers from Australia, Matt Botel, created the kinetic hand. This is a beautiful hand design, as you can see, really very, um, quite realistic looking in terms of the shape, because it was built from an actual 3D scan of a human hand. So very attractive looking. Uh, it also uses flexible components. So one of the benefits of that is if I operate it here for you, zero sound. I mean, it's silent. So that's a really nice benefit of the flexible components. 
downside to the flexible components is a lot of people have trouble printing, 3D printing these flexible materials. It is more challenging if you don't have your 3D printer set up exactly right for it. You know, things like having a direct drive extruder are pretty important. And uh, so some people struggle with that. But if you have the setup to do this, this is a, a great design. And I have to say that the documentation that Matt created for this design is second to none. I have never seen anything so well done. It's so detailed and with with uh, beautiful rendered uh, photos of all the different pieces and blowout diagrams, everything you could want to take you step by step through the whole process. So really nice design with some interesting elements. Uh, but again, the, the flexible parts are a challenge for a lot of our volunteers to produce. So uh, those are the designs I wanted to highlight. Let me switch back here so we can get my uh, guests on screen. Welcome back, guys. So I'd love to, I just kind of gave us a quick history there. I'd love to hear your comments. What do you guys think about, uh, you know, any of those designs that you might be familiar with and um, uh, thoughts about those different components that I showed and what you're hoping to see? Let me just start with you, Mike. Any thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, as I've been uh, experimenting with this, one of the things I've kept in mind is parts, replacement parts. You know, like you said, the dental bands wear out. I found a different type of band, but they still wear out. Um, and I think that's, you know, when we look at the, uh, the population that uses these, you know, they don't always have access to your Ace Hardware store or, you know, Amazon to order things. Um, so that's been always in the back of my mind to try to use things that are easily found. Uh, uh, right. And, uh, and, I, and I, I'll say ideally, I think it's going to be a combination of, of two things, Mike. We've talked about this. I, I want to, we're going to try to find materials that are widely available, like you said, so that people in any kind of area could find these kinds of things. But also, I'm hoping that these are things that, that we can help to source in bulk as we have in the past. Yeah. I want to continue to offer these assembly materials kits for people that, you know, care to go that route. And then we could send those anywhere in the world. That's been a very popular option, too. So one of those two options we would hope would be available um, to people to make it easier to put these together, yeah. yeah. So thoughts about, uh, some, let's talk about some of the specific things, Mike, that you worked on improving. What are the specific elements of this design that you'd like to see when we talk about this next hand design? What are, what are some of the specific design elements that you'd like to, to see in that from your, as a uh, user, you know? Yeah. Um... So, like I said, a lot of the things that I've done, I've, you know, kind of uh, bailed, you know, duct taped and uh, together. So it'll be fun to see them actually printed. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, okay, let's go in the order of things that broke. <laughs> so uh, the first thing to break was, uh, oh, here, I've, let me just put this down. It'd be easier to do that. Let's see. Okay, so. One of the first things that that broke was the hinge pin uh, here, and I ended up using uh, a curtain or um, closed clothes hanger, hang, you know, uh, hanging hanger rods for for this, um, and just cut them off, and they kind of friction fit in there. And they're very strong, and so that solved that because I had a couple of them break right away. Um, one of the challenges was the getting a good grip on the fingertips and these are actually guitar practice fingertips nice. so they're heavier yeah uh have spent a lot of time trying to you know source some of this stuff and it's funny how many weird places these things came from but so they're heavy duty or you know heavier duty latex they uh, that's right because they've got to hold up on those those strings yeah that's a great idea mm -hmm. the uh like i said we got some new uh O-rings, they're actually keyboard dampeners, you know, uh, again. Uh, and what, do you, what did you like about those O-rings that you're using compared to the other dental elastics? Yeah. Yeah, these will hold up for well, I don't know, 10 times longer than the... Uh, so they're more durable. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, the tensioner, uh, the original one, it, it, that broke right away, and I kind of kept having to put that together. And so I started looking at different ways to do the same thing. Basically, the tensioner just holds the lines in place so that you can adjust the fingers uh, to the right position. It needs to be strong because there's a lot of force on the hand when you're picking something up. Yes. Um, I, I haven't really tested this to the to the you know the level I'd like to because I don't want to break it. You know, but I 
this is pretty strong. You can pick up some pretty uh, heavy things. And so that's a very uh, integral part, kind of the, the drive train, I'll call it, from the tensioner to the lines to the through the fingers. Uh, and, you, and you've given I, it a... I it's, ended up finding something pretty well. And it's got this really, it's got that really sleek profile as opposed to this block that's sitting on top of it. Now you've right. kind of integrated it into that forearm component, which I really like. Yeah, and that's been one of the things that I've tried to consider in the design too is to make it look to make it look more um, I don't want to say realistic, but uh, to function more like a hand in the sense of a look it looks similar to your regular hand size wise, you know. Uh, function wise, but it also has a kind of that robotic look. Exactly. So I was never a big fan of trying to make a prosthetic hand look like, you know, a real hand. So I think it's, uh, I think it's got some kind of uh, uh, neat uh, uh, qualities that you can, you know, make it look kind of robotic, kind of futuristic, uh, in, in, in addition to being functional and all that. Sure. Yeah. So, okay. So we want it uh, to be, have a stronger grip. Uh, we want it to have components that hold up better. Uh, so less chance of breakage. And you've already made some of those improvements. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at my, my notes here from some of our recent meetings. We talked about uh, something that has improved efficiency, which I think comes back to that grip. So less mechanical resistance, just in the, the amount of leverage you can get in the gripping. Um, we talked about uh, the hardware, like you said, making sure that it's something that's really strong and effective, but also easy for people to get. Um, we'd like to kind of avoid the thermal forming, at least as an option, right? So maybe there's a version of the, the, the cuff that goes over the forearm. Maybe there's one version that you can thermal form, but maybe we give people another version that you don't have to thermal form. We, we heard that as a request. Um, and, you know, 3D printing the flexible materials can be hard for some people, so we're trying to avoid that if we can. Um, we wanted to offer some kind of ability to do fine motor functions, like picking up small objects. So maybe the ability to have certain fingers held closed so that you can operate, you know, just your index and thumb, for example, uh, things of that nature we talked about. Um, we've talked about, uh, you know, more effective materials for the part that goes over the palm and the fingertip covers, which you've already talked about, Mike. We talked about uh, improved adjustability, um, and we're going to talk about that in a moment in terms of how we're going at that from a design point of view. Uh, less noisy. I don't know if you touched on that, but we want we want the device to make less noise when it moves. And that's, again, I, I will talk about that in a moment because that's partly how we're going about the design and the CAD side of things, which we'll shift to in a moment. Um, and then we may end up, you know, with this new design after the uh, the wrist power version is released, we may proceed to develop some kind of a terminal device version that can be attached to a standard uh, prosthetic uh, device as well with a, you know, they, they use a, I think it's like a half inch screw um, on the end and uh, offer a voluntary open version of the design as well so that it would stay closed by default and you would be able to open it uh, by bending instead of the reverse. So these are some of the uh, alternate versions that we might release after the fact. So those are some of the goals that we talked about there. Um, and I'd like to now switch, like I said, to talk about some of that a little bit further. Let's talk a little about the design side. Yeah, of it. If, I, if I might jump Please, in. Please, Mike, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, we, I know we've talked about this in some of our meetings as far as making the hand um, so that it can do more fine, kind of fine motor uh, skills. Right. Um, and that was one of the kind of the ahas I had during all of this. You know, this, this hand is, uh, this hand is, when, when, when we make these hands, we focus on how this hand works, right? Um, but what I've found is that how it helps uh, just function with two hands. So, um, you know, for example, if I'm, you know, if I, if I, you know, cause most people I think have one good hand and one hand that is damaged or whatever you want to call it. So, you know, we've obviously learned uh, to type and write and do most things with our, you know, our good hand. Um, but, uh, you know, but the, uh, the prosthetic hand kind of helps support the good hand in, in things. So, you know, I will, I can write with this, but then now I can grab my cup of coffee. Oh, yeah. You know? I can, 
I can I can do a lot of things um, that just help two hands work together instead of trying to do everything now with the prosthetic hand. You know, I mean, I can I can grab my uh, grab my cell phone. You know, I can I can hold it while I'm doing something else. So it's really a, a synergy of both of both of them together. So. Uh, trying to make this two really fine things, I think, might be great in some uh, scenarios. But uh, for me, it does what it does great, and it frees my good hand up to do what it does great. So yes, yeah, so, and I'm so glad you brought that up because you know we've heard this from a lot of our uh, device users that, that have said similar things that you know these devices might not be all that advanced. Yes, there are far more advanced prosthetic devices out there that can do amazing things if you can afford them. But for what these do, I've, I've heard often people say that, you know, what it lets me do is it lets me free up a hand so that I can hold something with the enable device and then I can manipulate it with my other hand. And that makes all the difference in the world. So yeah. I hear what you're saying. The, the working together of those two hands, the device itself, it's pretty basic, right? I mean, it doesn't have all that much advanced functionality, but it does let you do a lot with that basis. Yeah. So yeah. um, I mean, things like in uh, social situations, you know, a lot of times, you know, people that are missing part of the hand, you, know, you may have to you know, hold the, something you know, like this and you know, juggle things around or sit things down. So, you know, for example, if I'm, you know, somewhere having a, you know, something to drink, you know, I can shake someone's hand. I don't have to do this, you know, so it's just, it's sure. kind of the, uh, uh, the peripheral things that you don't really think about with just the hand, but it's what it adds overall. Makes a lot of sense. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going about this. And I'm going to get, I want to shift just a little bit over momentarily to the, maybe a little bit more of the technical side of things. Cause I want to bring Bryce into the conversation. Bryce is one of several people on the team that are helping with the CAD work side of things, the actual 3d design, which is of course a huge part of this, not by any means the whole part, but, um, you know, there's a lot that like, there's a lot that goes into doing something like this, right? There's there's just a lot of brainstorming. There's a lot of looking at different designs. What have other people done? There's a lot of experimenting with different possibilities, testing out different materials, playing with different options. Just uh, you know, you guys have you know noticed, of course, you've seen, we've been going through all these different kinds of tests and experiments. We're just seeing what works, right? And we'll get there. We'll get to some great answers. And only once we kind of get through that brainstorming, we kind of figure out what we want to do, then we start to actually build it out in the 3D design software. And so as a team, we have decided to use Autodesk Fusion 360 as our modeling platform. Part of the reason we decided on that is because it is, it's a powerful uh, solid body modeling platform that is designed for parametric modeling, which we are going to be talking about in a moment here. And it is, um, it's great for collaborative work. You can have a bunch of people working together collaboratively on designs, which is what we're doing. And it's available, while it's, it's a commercial product, it is available free of charge for personal use and hobbyists, including folks like what we're doing. We're obviously using this for charitable purposes. And so you have access to a free copy of Fusion 360. So we thought it was a really good way to go. And so what that's allowing us to do, or we hope it will allow us to do, is to build this design parametrically. And Bryce, maybe you want to talk about that. What does that mean to build a design parametrically? And what is, what is the benefit of doing that? So the benefit of a parametric design is being able to go back after you basically create the design constraint and change it slightly. So when you're using CAD modeling tools, you basically have a list of how you build out your model. And if you ever want to go back and change something, the parametric design will cascade that change down into every other design change or design parameter that you have in your CAD model. So this is very useful, like um, Jeremy just said, when you have a collaborative design and when that many people are working on the exact same model. Absolutely. Now there's another benefit in our case, and this is important. One of the challenges we've had with our enabled designs over the years comes down to the, a, a matter of scaling. Obviously not everyone needs the same size. Small children need something very small. A large adult needs something much larger. And what happens is when you scale the parts up and down, everything is scaling up and down, which includes the tolerances, the spaces between the parts. And so because we need the designs to work at the smaller scales, there needs to be enough of a, of a gap there. What happens is when you make a device for a large adult, 
it ends up being kind of wobbly. Like you might have heard that, like on this Phoenix hand, you can you can hear how the fingers kind of wobble, and and when you operate it, you know, it can make a lot of noise. That noise, a lot of that is coming because you end up with a lot of extra space between the joints. So if we do our job right, which is going to involve doing our modeling in Fusion 360 and doing it parametrically, which has benefits from the design side of things, we're then going to have one of our team members um, help us to transport this into something called OpenScan, which is a tool that allows you to then do the scaling on the end. So when you go to download the files you need, you'll be able to say what, me what your measurements are or what scale you need. And it'll generate the parts for you in that scale, but it's going to do the scaling in a way where, for example, the hole sizes for screws can be kept the same size as the hand gets bigger. The spaces between the parts, like in the finger joints and the wrist hinges, can be kept at an exact measurement as the rest of the parts scale up and down. That's a very powerful thing. And so that's one of our primary goals for this process is to release a fully parametric design that can be scaled in those ways. I find that pretty exciting. I think we can pull this off and we have the right people on the team. We've got the guys that have the fusion uh, skills. We've got Sean Matheson who has the open SCAD uh, skills and is, has offered to help us with that. I mean, we've got just a great team of, of people together here. So I'm, I'm really optimistic about what we're gonna come up with here. So um, Bryce, what's your, you've already been doing some work. Let's talk about that a bit. You were working on a, a modified, uh, what we're calling the cuff, the part that goes over the forearm. You want to tell us a little exactly. bit? Exactly. What were you, what are you, what are you attempting to do there? What are the changes you're trying to work on that coming from? I actually have one in the malls right here. So one of the things that me and Mike have been talking about that has been kind of one of the ones we want to highlight is that you're bringing that tensioner compartment back inside. So that's a more kind of a sleek design on the top. This was uh, important because Mike was saying that having that part sitting on top, when you're trying to put on a t-shirt or a jacket, it would get snagged. So this part here, I just have a zip tie attached to it right now, but hopefully this compartment here will be able to attach uh, the temp uh, tensioners inside. And then we can uh, get, that, sorry. get that a little closer. To the sorry. So essentially, yeah, we just have a, a housing kind of compartment inside of this so that we can bring the tensioning system down. Very nice. Yeah. So the, you know, we didn't, we didn't get much detail, but that the tensioner system is based on these uh, zip tie mechanisms and, and that the zip ties obviously are adjustable. That becomes your adjustment mechanism, which I think is brilliant that, that Mike came up with. So uh, we're incorporating that. I do think it's, I want to point out, this is the great part about this design process. You guys are getting to see kind of behind the curtains here. So what Bryce just held up, let's, let's point out, that is by no means a final design. I know it looked kind of blocky and had like right angles. This is just an early prototype. We're just kind of just starting to bring that in. From a what it did is we came from a concept sketch that that Mike did, brought that into the 3D modeling platform, and now from there we can start to reshape it and tune it and contour it and optimize it and all that. So you're you're, you're getting a look at you know what you go through in the, the very early prototyping stage of, of a design process like this. It's very uh, iterative. You go back and forth many times. And that's <laughs> that, I, I have to say that is one of the most exciting things about this I, you know i mentioned back in 2014 i was part of a very similar team that worked collaboratively and we came up with the raptor and raptor loaded designs and i was so blown away by that process because here we had people from all over we had one guy from washington state one from down in florida i was in the chicago area i mean we were all over the country coming together via zoom calls to work together collaboratively we would come up with design doing our work online and sharing files of course online and because all of us had 3D printers, you know, you could we could all print something out in our respective locations and, you know, you're all holding the same thing. It's just there's something so cool about that. And the rate at which we were iterating, it was literally a 24 hour cycle at one point when we were getting down to the crunch. You know, it would be like we'd, we'd 3D print the design overnight. We would, we would, you know, whoever did the test print would do a quick video in the morning, you know, putting it together and showing how it works, share that video with the team. They would go ahead and make design changes based on that video, share the files later that day. You do another print, test print the next night. So literally a 24 hour iteration cycle blew my mind. I mean, that is just amazing. Mm -hmm. So it is yeah. a powerful thing. 
my perspective, it you know, I, I made those drawings. You know, I, I kind of sketched out all the different components, and I mean, they were as, they were as clear as could be. I mean, you could just take those and print them, right? <laughs> and as I spent some time, uh, we, we I realized that you know that there's a little translation that needs to happen there. There is. Uh, there is. Yeah, well, you're going to learn a lot going through this process. Yeah, you got to think about tolerances and think about what printers are capable of and, and, and how are the parts going to be oriented on the build plate and how will print. And yeah, we'll, we'll get into a lot of that. That's a lot of the fun. So yeah, we, you know, what we're doing is we're trying to kind of break it down into components and look at each one. So we're looking at like, what are we going to use for what is the mechanism that's going to operate the fingers? Is it going to be a uh, flexible cord and a non-flexible cord? Is it going to be some kind of elastic bands? We've we've tested out various kinds of spring mechanisms. You know, we're looking at torsion springs. Uh, we've looked at toggle bolts that have those, you know, built-in kind of, you know, springs. We, we're looking at all kinds of possibilities. So um, there's, uh, you know, there's that mechanism. What is it that actually handles the, the, the flexing and, and reversing motion of the fingers? What do we do with the hinges for the wrist? Um, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what do we do for the, the, I'm trying to think of the other components we've talked about. Well, the tensioner mechanism, which I think we've already kind of zeroed in on Mike's new design there. Um, fingertip coverings. What was that one, Mike? Down to the finger pads. The finger pads, the, the fingertips, yeah. right? We talked about fingertips so you could like pick things up. Um, what else? Help me out, guys. What else have we talked about in terms of the components that we're looking at? The um, oh, the hardware, right? What's the hardware that goes in through the hinges that actually, you know, are we using metal pins? Are we using Chicago screws? Are we using something 3D printed? Are we using something mm -hmm. like Mike? We didn't talk about that. You used pins that were friction fit, right? You want to talk about yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. The uh, so the the pins originally, um, I can't do this like looking in the mirror. Uh, they were little kind of uh, clips that went in, and I, don't, and I found that they were pretty fragile at first. Uh -huh. So I took a hanger, basically a, a plastic hanger, and uh, what I did is I kind of dimpled around the center, as right where it passes through the, the center joint, so it would it would fit tight in there. Yep. And then the outside of the you know the other part of the hinge finger would, would move really uh, easily yeah. and it held it tight in there. So it wasn't like a, a screw that could kind of clatter around. It was a little more silent. So yeah. it made it stronger. That was kind of my first uh, thought in doing all this. And, is to make it stronger. and it's such a small thing, but that really, that really, I think is a brilliant idea because now you have that with the friction fit in the center, like you said, and the, the, the rest of the finger able to rotate freely on the outsides you end up with a very low amount of friction and a very low amount of noise, you know, because it's rotating on a smooth surface. So I, I just think that's really a nice, nice option there. Yeah, it works well. And uh, a, lot, a lot of it had to do with fit and, uh, I guess, function, you know, in, in addition to strength, making it work uh, like, a, like a real hand in, in the sense of, you know, padding. So it, you know, it can grip a little bit better. Um, you know, whole things that won't slip, you know, the plastic printed pieces, you know, you can imagine that something hard slips really, really easily uh, inside, you know, making it more customizable and uh, finding materials for that. Uh, so that's a big part of it too, is, uh, you know, making it fit comfortable. And one thing I noticed uh, in some of the videos that I've seen of, you know, people fitting uh, kids, part of the fit is, if the cuff is, you know, not snug against the forearm, or the, or the hand is loose in the in the pocket here, you know, you there's a lot of movement wasted because if this cuff is moving around, it's not right. translating into you know, moving the fingers. That's a good so, point. I mean, this is the point where I have really very little movement to operate, uh, and it just means better control, better fine, you know, order skills, kind of a thing, and it uh, just makes it function more like a real hand so i mean even just the same the same device but but adjusted and set up properly can make a big difference too. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that mike it's a really important point that that sort of uh illustrates how important the fitting is like you said it's not just about the design and it's worth mentioning that you know you're in a, a nice situation because obviously you're fitting for yourself and you can adjust it as needed 
a lot of our volunteers will try to make a device remotely for somebody and kind of you know ship it off to them and it's it's i know it's necessary sometimes but it's not ideal and the reason is because of that fitting in customization um you know in the cases where i've had the opportunity to work uh to make a device for somebody in collaboration with a prosthetist what i found is that the prosthetist would would do the final modifications and tweaks and some thermal forming and things like that on the spot with the patient. So they're they're looking at how it fits. Oh, I need to tweak this here. I need to add a little bit more Velcro over here so it gets held in there better. They're making those final tweaks on the spot based on the anatomy. And I think that's really important to get that, that, that good fit that you talked about. And I made a couple of videos on that. Um, like I said, I started myself in mind making these, but as I used it more and more, I thought, well, there's a lot of good things that I've learned that I think will really help others, even just uh, putting it together. Um, there's some tricks and tips that you can use to to put it together more easily and you know, fit it better. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of things like that, too, that uh, are very helpful. Bryce, how about you? I, I know you're kind of more on the CAD side of things, but I'm curious, are there any particular features or things that you'd like to see in this design, things that maybe you're particularly interested in um, as you think about the new design? Um, I think one thing we want to bring up and that we have decided upon is the material and going with the PET-G to make it stronger. I think that's a very important part because I, I only actually really use PLA, which is more of a brittle material, but it's very easy to use. So I think material selection is definitely something interesting that we should think about. And I think PETG is definitely the answer. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's, let's talk about why that is in case some folks listening in might not be familiar with this. Um, that's not to say that when we released this design, you can't print it in PLA or tough PLA or ABS or any number of other materials. You can't. The point is we are designing it with the intent of PETG being the recommended material. And that matters for a couple of reasons. Number one, different materials handle differently. They print differently. They have a different level of viscosity. They, they flow in different ways. And there are some design considerations. We might use slightly different tolerances in our designing, uh, knowing that we're printing in PETG compared to that we know would be printed in PLA, which print more accurately, I would say. Um, but, more importantly for the enable community, what we found is PLA, it's so popular and for good reason. It's so easy to print, it's so widely available, it's affordable, it's environmentally friendly, it's available in a bunch of colors. I mean, what's not to like? Well, the only downside is it has very poor um, temperature resistance. So if you get it into any a hot climate, like if you leave it in, in the, a hot car on a, on a summer day, it's gonna deform. It'll actually be in a different shape when you come back to that car. So not the most, um, not the optimal material for enable devices, unless you know that they're not going to be in a hot environment, which is, it's hard to be sure of. So, you know, these days we, we try to steer clear of PLA for devices we're making for people. Now there's a lot of other options. I mean, tough PLA is great because it's a lot stronger, but it's just as easy as PLA to print. But a lot of people don't know this. There is no benefit in terms of temperature resistance. It's the same as PLA. So doesn't really help you out there. It's still going to deform. Uh, ABS is a material that used to be a lot more popular when 3D printing was kind of getting going in the consumer sector. And uh, a lot of printers were sort of optimized for that. It is stronger. It's more temperature resistant. It has some nice benefits, but you know, it's, it's a petroleum based plastic. It's, I don't, is it the kind of thing that we want to have, you know, somebody wearing these parts on their, on their body, you know, when it's made out of that, I don't know, it's probably okay, but maybe we want to play it safe. Um, not to mention it tends to warp. It's, it's a hard material to print. So anyway, there's lots more materials. We won't go through all of them, but over the years, we've really kind of zeroed in as a community on PETG because um, it is, uh, it's a recyclable material. It is, um, you know, non-toxic and, uh, you know, most of the varieties are even food safe, you know. It is um, fairly easy to print. It's a little trickier. You have to get your settings right. Otherwise, it'll be a little stringy, but you can get that well under control with settings. Uh, but the nice thing is that it has the better temperature resistance. It'll hold up in a hotter climate, and yet you can still thermoform it if needed. So some of our designs you need to print one way and then use heat to shape them differently. You can still do that with PETG. So it's like that perfect middle ground where you can still thermoform it, 
but it's not going to, you know, deform just, you know, on a hot day. So that's kind of the material of choice. It's very strong. It holds up really well. Uh, it's affordable. It's, it's becoming more widely available. And I will mention, you know, uh, 3D Universe has developed four custom skin tone colors of PETG material specifically for the Native community. So, and we'll try to add more over time, but we have uh, four different uh, skin tones in PETG in both sizes, the 1.75 and the 2.85. And we, we hope that that, you know, uh, will continue to help support the work that this community is doing. So yes, we are going to be designing it with uh, PETG in mind as the recommended material. That's not to say that you absolutely have to use that material, but uh, it's a good point, Bryce. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's some of the things we've been working on, and I don't know, uh, you know how far this might go in our design, but different materials. You know, we're talking about soft materials with the fingertips, possibly uh, creating a, palm, a pad palm, which I was thinking that's about. That's right. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any advantage using something for the hand versus the fingers, but and maybe that gets beyond uh, what the uh, average person wants to do, you know, with... Well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, that's an excellent point, Mike. And, and this goes back to our discussion of 3D printing not always being the answer. There might be, for example, if we wanted to do some kind of a palm covering and we didn't want people to have to print a flexible material, well, maybe there's some kind of material that we could get in sheets and just cut it out, um, you know, and attach it or something. We'd have to, we'd have to look at that. Uh, for the fingertips, again, I completely agree, and I want to mention that I actually just over the recent last few days, I've had email exchanges with uh, colleagues of ours who are now part of the Enable community, but they are also part of 3D Crowd, another charitable organization using 3D printing to do wonderful things. These guys are working on a project to help explore new and different materials for Enable devices. And one of the things that they're looking at is using a, a new flexible material that's available that is conductive and using that for the fingertips so that you can operate touch devices like your smartphone and your iPad. I thought that was brilliant. I mean, I think that's just a great idea. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that. Yeah, that's great. I know we talked about in one of our, our uh, Zoom meetings that uh, some, uh, some young lady was looking, wanted something that she could paint, you know, her fingernails. She wanted to paint her fingernails, right? Uh, different colors. Well, I thought about those those fingertip inserts. I mean, that would be kind of fun because obviously you could make these in a lot of different colors. And for a kid, you know, it, you know, they can, you know, make it. You know, a young lady could have you know red fingertips or something. You know, I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot of neat color options that you can do uh, by you know do, using the different materials. Absolutely. Okay, so we've got. And I, I apologize to the audience. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. I always forget something that if you are watching this live on Facebook and if you post any comments there on the Facebook live, we will see those here. We can bring those into the discussion. So please do join us. I'm sorry. I know we're heading into the end of our session here, but we can always follow up with you after the fact if we miss you as well. So I do see a comment here from, as a matter of fact, Eric Bubar, one of the volunteers that I mentioned earlier who did the excellent work on, on testing these devices for strength. And he says, any thoughts to a BOA-like system that will rely a that will really adaptively tighten areas differently for getting very good snug fits. Something like a TPU gauntlet, what we're calling a cuff, that has structure that runs parallel or along the arm for stiffness, but some give perpendicular to the arm to allow for adjustability, like Donna Zimmerman's Zelix cuff. Now, I have to admit, I haven't seen the Zelix cuff. Have either of you guys seen it? No, I haven't. Okay, so I'm going to have to check that out. When, when Eric talks about a BOA-like system, in case uh, people watching aren't familiar with this, if you've ever seen ski boots, it's very popular on those. It's something like a knob that you twist and it tightens it. It has like cords that go through it. And so by simply twisting a knob, you can ratchet it down and tighten it as much as you need to. And a while back, some of our volunteers uh, that were working with the Cyborg Beast design, it was uh, Dr. Jorge Zuniga, I think was one of the ones who first started doing this. He, he got one of those bow tensioners and put it on the back of a, of a hand device and used that to, as, as a tensioning mechanism to adjust it. Uh, we have looked into that quite a few times. and We've actually made some significant efforts to establish relationships with the companies that make those. We have been unsuccessful so far. We just, they, they just have not, we have not been able to find a solution that we could get affordably that could be kind of plugged into an enabled device. 
my, that doesn't mean that you couldn't make something. Um, somebody more skilled than myself at uh, you know MacGyvering things together probably could. But so far, we've not been able to come up with a sort of an off-the-shelf solution that we could sort of buy in bulk and put into kits and things like that. If you have come up with anything, Eric, or anybody out there listening, please share that with us. I'd love to hear it. Uh, we're going to have ongoing discussion about this, by the way, on the Enable Hub. Hope you'll join us there. The links to the Hub are on the main Enable website that I mentioned earlier, enablingthefuture.org, so that you only have to remember one site. I'll just point you there. But over on the Enable Hub, where, which is the forum where we all talk and exchange ideas, please share your ideas, share links. If you have any ideas about these types of tensioner systems or other ideas, things that we should be considering, please do share those. We, we absolutely will incorporate that. And, and another follow-up comment from Eric saying, I just saw some shoelace designs on Amazon for about $15 for a BOA system with laces. Amazing. Depending on the price point you're looking for, working on a cheaper version in the lab. Well, that is exciting, Eric. I'm so glad that you let us know. Um, I think that's a great idea. I would love, I'm going to have to check that out on Amazon, so please uh, share that link with us, and uh, we will immediately uh, look into testing that. Now, your timing could not be better. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think the one of the nice things about um, the way that we're doing this parametrically is we can approach it in kind of a modular way, right? Maybe we have a version that uses a, a zip tie tensioner. And then there's a different version where you can slap on a BOA you know, tensioner. And maybe there's different options for different types of fingers and maybe different options for different types of, you know, to accommodate different types of anatomies. If we do this right, we, we could come up with sort of a modular system where you can choose the different components the way you want them or need them. So all kinds of exciting possibilities. Thanks for sharing that, Eric. And I shared a link. I will definitely be checking that out. Thank you. Um, what else? Any other ideas? I'll, I'll keep an eye on the comments coming in from the audience, but how about from you two? Mike, Bryce, anything else that you guys are thinking about that you'd like to see in core? Just wish list, right? If you could kind of wave a magic wand and have, have anything in a sort of a dream prosthetic device that would still be cost effective, of course, staying with our, our community goals here. Well, from my perspective, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but, you know, strong, first of all, um, good fit, all that design. So, you know, it functions easily. It's simple to you know, assemble. It's simple to maintain. But where I really wanted to go, which is why I really reached out, is to make a design that looks really cool. You know, I mean, I've seen some, like, fairings for legs and different things that are, you know, very uh, artistically designed. Yes. And. Uh, you know, I, I think this could get to a point where, you know, it could look really cool. I mean, you know, folks with the, you know, that have had a hand that's you know, missing part of a hand or whatever, uh, I think, you know, you want to kind of hide it. You know, you don't want people, you know, whatever, you know, it just could be a little awkward, uh, more so growing up. But to have a hand that now looks really cool and kind of robotic and, you know, the, the looks you get are because, wow, that's cool. Anyway, I, I like to design it so it just looks very um, similar to a regular hand, but, you know, obviously... A little bit on the robotic side. Yeah, that's, like, that's what I... That's awesome. And, uh, you know, I think that's... It's, it's an interesting point you bring up because a lot of it is a matter of personal taste, and I think a lot of it is cultural. What we've learned over the years is that in a lot of other regions outside of the U.S., there's more cultural sensitivity to blending in. There's, there's people seem to want to steer clear of the bright, flashy colors and designs. They want it to match their other hand as well as possible, so that it's just not as noticeable. And and we try to accommodate both, right? You know, it's it's whatever the need is. That's what we try to what we try to develop. So, um, it's it's a good opportunity to mention another exciting collaboration that we have going on. Actually, another uh, a gentleman named uh, Brian reached out to us who has his own. Uh, organization where he's been developing some free software for people for customizing prosthetic de designs and uh, he had been focusing on lower limbs but now he's working with us to be able to you know work with our designs and what it what it is is he takes the the 3d models of our designs like the phoenix hand like the one that you're wearing mike he would come up with we would give him those 3d models and his software lets you take whatever kind of graphics you want like a tattoo design or a cool colorful yeah. design or whatever you want and it'll kind of overlay it and shape it to that geometry and let you give you something that then you can print out on sticker material 
and then apply that to your to your device and create these really cool designs. Like they actually had a client that lost both of his arms in an electrical accident, and he wanted when he got his prosthetics, he wanted tattoos on his arms, and so he they actually used this this uh, method to apply these very cool looking tattoo designs onto his devices. So I, th I think it would be very cool if we could offer that option for people to customize it easily, however they want it to look. So part of it, I guess, is part of it is the geometry, right? You know, we, you want the geometry itself, the shape, to look a certain way and have a certain look to it. And then there's, you know, what do we put on top of that, like custom overlays or, you know, you know, fairings or things like that that you could further customize the device with. Well, and, uh, you know, back to the design, you know, like we were talking about, that's cool too. But uh, part of my thought process in working on this was, uh, to make it real sleek, you know, that's why the big tension around top and why we're talking about Bryce and I are, well, my design was actually to put the, uh, the mechanics of it inside. So it's very smooth and sleek. Um, you know, just, uh, like I said, kind of giving that robotic less of a mechanical look. So it almost looks, I mean, you know, it could be operated by, you know, whatever, but it doesn't look like, you know, hiding a lot of the mechanism, I guess, is kind of my goal to make it look sleek and smooth and uh... I like that yeah and, and you pointed this out in one of our previous meetings it's not just about looking sleek it's also that it helps so that it doesn't catch on things when you're moving around right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's why that uh, tensioner broke you know reaching in someplace or you know it, uh, it can kind of get in the way but and, and it's exposed to damage you know and it's uh, yeah but just Absolutely. sleek and uh, I keep thinking of uh, the stormtroopers in uh, Star Wars you know that yeah kind of, uh, Kind of a sleek, smooth, uh, robotic, futuristic look. All right, all right. Well, we got our work cut out for us. That could be a lot of fun. Uh, we have a, a question here from the audience asking about that software I mentioned. That uh, this collaboration we have going on, asking if it could output multi-material files for like a palette or MMU printing. Uh, the answer is I don't know, but I will find out and get back to you. I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't know enough about the formats it's exporting in. So I, I've seen a demo of the software, very cool looking, very well uh, built from the look of it, but haven't gotten into those details about file formats and whatnot. So let me get back to you on that. It's a good question. Um, anything else? Any other ideas or things that you guys would just you know think that you'd like to see in the design? Um, Bryce, any, anything that uh, you have in mind there? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, these devices are purely mechanical, which makes sense. At least what we're they're... right. Yes. Yeah, and uh, the only other thoughts I have is to incorporate some sort of bioelectric sensor, but then that becomes complicated. So, may, and that may be a future phase of our work. We'll see if this team wants to move forward into that. Um. I will say there's been some very cool work done in the community around myoelectric devices. And in fact, uh, the same volunteer that I mentioned recently, uh, Matt Bartell, who did the, the kinetic hand, uh, he has been working on something very cool around a powered device that instead of using the traditional myoelectric sensor, which is something that you might wear around your arm and mm -hmm. it's trying to sense the sort of electrical signals in your muscles, basically, they tend to be a little glitchy. They, they, they aren't all that reliable in most cases, and they, they, tend to, they, they tend to be a little bit hard to calibrate and get to work reliably. Well, he's come up with a really interesting way of doing it that relies on, I'm not going to describe this really well, but it had something to do with a physical sensor, where it's essentially uh, something that as it, as it tightens or as your muscle tightens, it's physically depressing something through that, through that tension, and it's basically just detecting that physical uh, pressure and so he's using some kind of a physical or optical sensor again I don't remember the details but it's not using myoelectric at all and he said that his initial testing was showing that it was immensely reliable required almost no tuning and calibration and uh, you know it sounded really encouraging so if that pans out maybe that's the kind of thing that you know we could work back into you know, the design we come up with it could be all kinds of fun with that um, I just I wonder Jeremy if that's a piezoelectric cell he's got in there. Could be. I apologize. I don't remember the specifics, but that's something we can follow okay. and get details from it. It's always been very important. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so all kinds of exciting things. Um, and I want to just take the opportunity to invite the community, anybody here that's watching, anybody that happens to find this recording down the road or 
you know, finds this in the Enable Hub, please share your ideas. Let us know anything that you're thinking about that you might like to see in a new design or that you think would be beneficial, uh, either as a device user or as somebody that's made these devices before or just somebody as an outside observer. Please share your input. We really like to hear from everybody. Um, a couple more comments here. Uh, one from uh, Eric saying, force-sensitive resistors can do it pretty well. They're pretty cool and cheap. Not sure if that's what he's using. Might be, yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Eric. So clearly, he's Eric Bubar has done a lot of work in this area too. So if 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 we or anyone else decides you want to go down this path, let's let's connect with Eric Bubar. Let's connect with uh, uh, Matt Botel and uh, anyone else that uh, we can we can find in the community. I know there are several others that have have done work in this area. I'm not thinking of their names at this point. And we can maybe pull something collaborative together around that. So we're, uh, we're coming from the top of our hour here. We've got to uh, start to wrap. Do you guys have any final thoughts? Let me go to you first, Bryce. Um, I guess one thing I just want to say is that I'm, when I first printed one of my devices, I was amazed at how simple it was and how much work. This was the unlimited uh, Phoenix hand I printed, and I was pretty much able to do it in one go. So anyone who's got a 3D printer and is looking to print a prosthetic hand, this is a very cool organization. Yeah, I couldn't, I mean, I was, you know, one of those guys that was just printing out trinkets from Thingiverse on my printers, and then I came across one of these hands and I just blew me away. You can do what with a 3D printer? And it's not hard, like, like Bryce said, don't be intimidated, folks. Any one of you can make these devices. I guarantee it is not hard. We've got great video tutorials. We've got great documentation. We've got the materials that you need. It really is doable. Mike, any, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, I was going to say, uh, you know, and all the things that I've done and learned, I, I started putting some videos together and putting them on a little YouTube channel, but there's some information about how to assemble them, string them, adjust them, uh, just little things I've learned. So uh, it might be helpful to, you know, people who are building these or users, but uh it's called the Prosthetic Hand Test Lab, and uh, it's a YouTube channel. A bunch of you know different videos. Some of them might, I think might be pretty helpful to some people who are you know, wanting to really you know do some of the things we're talking about and just adjust them really well, make them fit, make them function. So hopefully there's some helpful helpful hints there. Excellent. That was the Prosthetic Hand Test Lab on YouTube. Yeah. Is that right? All right, I'll uh, get that link from you, Mike, and I'll, I'll include that then when we do the blog post uh, right up for this as a follow-up, so we'll get people that link. Well, this has been a lot of fun, but uh, as, as always, we have limited time, so we're going to have to wrap for now. I hope we will do this again, though, as we get further in the process, maybe as we come up with some prototypes or have a design. Let's get back together, share what we've come up with here. Uh, thanks to the help of those uh, watching and sharing their ideas and, and coming together from this community. It'll be interesting to see what we can do here. Um, and uh, uh, we will uh, we'll share those results with everyone. As always, uh, the recording from today is going to go up on our YouTube channel. It'll also go out uh, as a podcast. If you'd like to listen to the audio version, it'll be available on all the major podcast channels and the 3D Universe on Tethered. So thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, please continue to share your comments. We'll continue to respond and follow up with you. And join us, enablingthefuture.org which will eventually lead you over to the Enable Hub, where we can uh, meet you and collaborate together. Great to have you, Mike, Bryce. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye, everyone. Bye.